Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Sanj Kaka. And I'm Tracy McRae. Getting and saving an excessive number of items, gradual buildup of clutter in living spaces, and difficulty discarding things are usually the first signs and symptoms of hoarding disorder. A person with hoarding disorder experiences distress at the thought of getting rid of items. Hmm, that sounds rather familiar. Mm. Uh-oh. A hoarding ranges <laughs> from mild to severe. In some cases, hoarding may not have much impact on your life, while in other cases, it seriously affects your functioning on a daily basis. I'm playing with fire here, Dr. Kakar. Uh, people with hoarding disorder may not see it as a problem, making treatment especially challenging. Here to discuss treatment for hoarding disorder is Mayo Clinic psychologist, Dr. Craig Sachuk. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Sachuk. It's great to see you again. Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, before you got here, we were saying I used to love the show Hoarders because it made me feel better about myself. And then I realized, oh, wait, these people actually have a disorder. So now I don't. No, I don't like watching that show anymore. Yeah, it's a pretty a pretty tough show. I mean, it, it's in the era of, of showing some mental health issues on TV, and uh, it, it shows the reality of you know some of the impairments and the living conditions that these folks go through. I have some qualms with exactly how the, uh, the program uh, dealt with the treatment aspect of things, but I'm hoping we can clarify some of that today. So what makes it uh, obsessive compulsive disorder? Yeah, actually, originally, from a diagnostic standpoint, it was embedded within uh, the obsessive compulsive uh, as a variant of obsessive compulsive disorder um, but but however the phenomenology and the symptomatology of, of hoarding is actually different than OCD um, hoarding is actually more common than OCD uh, that it feels less ritualistic than you would see with OCD and then also with um, traditional OCD they have obsessions about thoughts that really cause them a lot of distress and that they fear Whereas with hoarders, when you think about um, acquiring things and holding on to things, there's more of a positive affect, you know, with that, the desire to hold on to these things rather than the fear that goes along with it. So in the DSM-5, which is the latest iteration, they've actually separated out hoarding disorder um, and stopped calling it compulsive hoarding. So Dr. Sorsha, we all uh, collect things. I like to collect things. And I didn't think I had a particular disorder. When does that become uh, a problem for people? Yeah, there's really two markers that show up for this. This is actually one of them is, um, and this is the only one as far as I know in the in the DSM-5 that uh, signifies this, is that when an actual living space becomes functionally impaired, so it cannot be used for its intended purpose. So we think of a kitchen, it's where we prepare food. Um, and if the clutter is getting in the way of it's piling up on the counters, across the stove, um, getting in the way of uh, you know, the, the kitchen table, so where a person can eat um, a bathroom that becomes so cluttered, you can't use it to be able to go to the bathroom. That's one thing when the impairment in the living space for its intended purpose. The second is functional impairment with the individual. And this can happen uh, with um, social relationships and breakdown in social relationships, conflicts, um, inability to sustain a job, go into work, um, or uh, depression from isolation that can occur. Speaking of depression, do hoarders have other mental health issues that go along with Hoarding? Yes, it's actually more common than not. And this is, again, another differentiation between um, OCD and hoarding that it's, in fact, much more likely that hoarders will have a comorbid depressive disorder as opposed to another anxiety disorder, which the reverse can actually be true for traditional obsessive compulsive disorder. So what are the risk factors for developing hoarding disorder? Yeah, there's a few different ones. Um, one, we can think about uh, biologic risk factors. We know that hoarding uh, does tend to run in families, and it may not be the full condition of hoarding, but sometimes the traits towards being a pack rat and collecting and having difficulties uh, discarding things. Um, but there definitely is a, a larger um, proportion with uh, genetic influence there. It tends to run in first degree family members. Um, secondly, is that we think of environmental risk factors. So this could be isolation. This tends to happen in private. So it's uh, typically this um, condition goes on for a long period of time before the impairments come to light or even like family members or close friends even see this. So just the nature of how this can fly under the radar, it can happen. Then there's also more psychological things that can be risk factors. Um, trauma history can be common among these folks and even loss. And uh, in many cases uh, that folks can identify a particular point in time where the hoarding uh, just kind of flared up. 
One, one other factor that uh, is important too, and, and this is kind of the nature nurture uh, thing is because it runs in families, sometimes it's modeling. You know, people learn that everything has value, can be used at some point in some time, don't be wasteful. Um, and when that's modeled to you, you carry those things forward. I think it's interesting that, uh, as we said in the introduction, a lot of people who have this hoarding disorder don't think it's a problem. So if there's, you know, something else like um, anxiety or depression where you can't see it, um, with hoarding, you can see it. The evidence is right there. You can't move around your home like you used to be able. Why is it that people who are hoarders can't see that it's a problem? Yeah, there's, there's really three big things that go on into the types of symptoms that we see in, in compulsive hoarding. Uh, so one is difficulties with information processing. So they have difficulties with attention, concentration, um, organization, and decision making. Um, so sometimes that leads to not necessarily being aware of a problem. I'm just messy. You know, I'm just mm -hmm. a little disorganized. Um, secondly is um, problems with their beliefs. So they have what's called a double-barreled reinforcement that they like doing what they're doing. They're interested in like acquiring things as the thrill of the hunt, or I could really use this for some reason in some way, or boy, this person will really like this and it feels good. And sometimes they do the behaviors too to make themselves feel less bad if they're really stressed, um, mourning the loss of something. This may be a thing that they do to feel less bad. So there's a double-barreled level of reinforcement where they don't notice it. And they see things differently than we do. So this could be used in some way someday or, or this, um, this is so unique and, and different. And then there's problems in behavior, and that's where the avoidance you know, comes into play, where um, they realize that they've got clutter and it can cause them problems in life, but they feel too overwhelmed to deal with it, or I'll just deal with it later, you know, kind of idea, um, putting things off. But then the thrill of the hunt and the acquiring, so doing too much of some kind of behavior, again, it serves a purpose and it tends to elevate the mood and at the same time kind of put aside some difficult emotions. Uh, I think this is fascinating, Tracy. I'm sure we all have a degree of hoarding. So it, Dr. Shawshank, if you have this disorder, what, what can you do to, to treat this? Oh, what should family members do? Yes. Yes, well, family plays a huge role in this, and this is actually uh, something in my entire career of working in mental health. Um, this is the condition that, in my books, is the most challenging to treat, wow. um, but also the most rewarding uh, to treat because you can really make some good progress. The trick is getting plugged in with the right system of care. This is a systems-based approach, and I think exactly, you know, you mentioned the word family. We have to have family um, and functional friends, I should say, functional family members and functional friends involved because you really need a team. It's well, a team having approach. them just come and clean everything out doesn't work either because then they just continue hoarding. Exactly, because the clutter in and of itself is not the problem. It's a manifestation of what the problem is, which is difficulties with information processing. So it's very practical strategies. We uh, teach people in terms of organization, um, decision making. We also focus in on the difficulties in their thinking and learning how to challenge those acquisition beliefs right in the moment. And then also working on very practical um, decluttering exercises. How do you sort into categories? Um, how do you use your living spaces for that logical capacity that they have for items? But you really do need a team approach, and it is a longer-term treatment. Another absolutely essential component of treatment is doing the therapy in home. So you're actually physically in their environment wow. working for those things. And it's actually, uh, in all honesty, it's been a challenge for mental health providers to be able to do that because sometimes liability reasons, they don't want you going off site um, into a person's home mm -hmm. uh, and for billing reasons uh, that you may not be able to bill for your services outside of that. If people uh, recognize that maybe they need to seek help, what should they do? Contact their uh, local primary care physician may be the first place to start um, to be able to look at what resources are available. I often find uh, county social workers, um, too, um, actually might be in a great position to be able to identify what resources are available in the community. We've been talking about hoarding disorder with Mayo Clinic psychologist Dr. Craig Sawchuk. Fascinating. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Sawchuk. Great. Thank you again for having me.